you for joining us for today's Ipsos webinar, Exploring Ways Brands Can Create Meaningful Connections with Consumers. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Emmanuel Probst, SVP in Ipsos's Brand Health Tracking Team, where he supports numerous Fortune 500 companies by providing them a full understanding of their customer's journey. Emmanuel's background combines over 16 years of market research and marketing experience with strong academic achievements. And recently his book, Brand Hacks, has made several bestsellers lists, including Wall Street Journal and USA Today. Emmanuel, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Helen, for the nice introduction and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. I'm excited about this webinar. And we'll get started straight away. The starting point for Brand Hacks is to say the world we live in as consumers or practitioners is chaos. And here's why we're just overwhelmed with media. We're overwhelmed with information, with advertising. We consume about 11 hours of media per day. We check our phones about 83 times a day. We post 49,000 pictures on Instagram collectively. And that's to say that as marketing, market research, branding, and advertising professionals, we are bubbled. And what I mean by this is in our industry, we read even more than everyone else. We uh, consume specific media channels like Ad Age, Ad Week, Campaign, you name it. We go to conferences. We tend to live in big cities uh, that has slightly changed with COVID, but often many of us live in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, you name it, but those big metros. And I just to say candidly that it's even harder for us to be connected to the real world, if you will, to real consumers. Now, the bad news, if you will, is most consumers don't care about most brands. That is really it. Why? Because people are once again overwhelmed in any grocery stores, you'd find 150 different kinds of popcorn. On Amazon, you'd find dozens of thousands of swim trunks. So uh, based on this assumption, what we want to discover today is what are people really after and what people, our consumers, our audience is really trying to achieve is to find meaning in life. And as branding, advertising, marketing, and market research professionals, if we understand these meanings, once we understand these meanings, we can build brands that will help fulfill consumers, full, uh, will help consumers fulfill these meanings. And as such, those brands are going to become more meaningful in and of themselves, and people will be more loyal to these brands. So before we discover those meanings, I just want to bring to your attention the importance of psychographics. And what I mean here is for the longest time, we have looked at demographics like age, gender, region, household income, educational background. And there is nothing wrong with demographics, but the truth is they're a little bit shallow because unless we look at someone purchasing a home or a car, income, for example, is not a key driver. I just want to show us the importance of psychographics, those lifestyle attributes, if you will. And illustrate the limitation of the demographic-based segmentation approach. On the left of my screen, we have Prince Charles. He was born in 48, he grew up in England. He was married twice. He has two children. He's successful in business, we can say so. And he's pretty wealthy. Now we pause and think of another gentleman who has the exact same demographics attributes and his name is Ozzy Osbourne. And that really illustrates that contrast and the limitation of those core demographics that we've been using in the industry. Another example on my screen, on uh, the big picture on the left, is a Ford Bronco. A Ford Bronco, for those of you who may remember, by the way, that was the car O.J. Simpson used to escape the police in the uh, in a murder trial, and that was back in 98. Top right is an Italian car, it's a Maserati, 17 miles to the gallon. Bottom right is a Tesla, it's 
it's an electric car. What those three cars have in common is they're all about, about $80,000. And the point I'm making here is if as a consumer, as a driver, you're willing and able to sh spend $80,000 on a car, you may choose to make three very different statements. I'm kind of a bad boy, like O.J. Simpson, if you will, um, maybe a vintage nostalgia type of feel. That's the Ford Bronco. I have that fast European romantic flair, and that's the Maserati. I'm on board with saving the planet, and I'm mindful about the environment, and I also love technology, and that's the Tesla. So three expensive cars on my screen that make three different statements about who you are. I also want to tell you about the difference between fads, trends, and meanings. The book is a lot about meanings. Building brands, in my opinion, is a lot about meanings. And I want to illustrate to you what we mean here. A fad is something that fades super fast. And a good example here are diets. Why? Because it's unlikely that any of us will be willing to eat steamed broccoli every day for the rest of our lives. Um, diets are always impactful in the short run. However, it's very hard to stick with those diets because of those restrictions. The trend in contrast is something that lasts longer than a fad. And here a good example I feel is Pilates, CrossFit, uh, those trends in fitness. It lasts longer than a fad and you see brick and mortar businesses being built around those trends. And if you think of CrossFit, for example, or gym studios, it's all about are they going to create a community? Are they going to create a connection with their audience? Because we don't need a local gym studio just to provide us with free weights. We can order these on Amazon. And last but not least, a meaning. Something that's meaningful is something that has a deeper impact on us. And meanings are pretty much evergreens, whereby people will um, Cheers the same meanings today as they did a few years ago and as they will over the next few years. And of course, we'll see many examples in, in this presentation. So we're on a quest as uh, people, as consumers. We're on a quest to find three different types of meanings, personal meaning, social meaning, and cultural meaning. Personal meaning is what we do for ourselves. Simply put is, who are you and who do you want to be? Who do you want to become? That's what personal meaning is about. And some powerful examples in advertising. This is an ad for the Venetian in Las Vegas. And think about it, we're not advertising functional benefits here. Well, guess what? The Venetian has a pool, a spa, a gym, and some very well-appointed rooms. That's fine, so do hundreds of other hotels, let alone in Las Vegas. What the Venetian is bringing your attention to is come as you are and pitching a transformative experience, if you will, whereby you can decide to be whoever you want to be, as you can see from the illustrations, as you can see from the ads, when you come to the Venetian. That is the real personal meaning that the Venetian brand intends to carry over to you. Another example is from Equinox. That's a upmarket popular chain of health clubs in the US. And here again, Equinox is not selling you a treadmill, if you will, nor is it selling you free weights. We can get those from Costco, that's fine. What Equinox is doing for you is providing you, facilitating a transformative experience. Make yourself a gift to the world. So this really illustrates what I described before. Personal meaning is who are you and who do you want to become? Social meaning are about our social interactions with the world around us. It's the language, it's the words, it's the music, and of course it's the brands we use to make sense of the world around us. And here I want to show you a example of an ad that is uh, particularly powerful at conveying social meaning. And here, folks, what we see, and I'm switching back to our presentation, is such a great example of 
a brand that connects people and that's Google in this case. So remember, we spoke about personal meaning. Who am I and who do I want to become? Who do you want to be? That's the transformative experience. We spoke about social meaning. That is how do brands connect people and help them make sense of the world around them. The third type of meaning is cultural meaning. That includes your knowledge, your beliefs, the arts, and here again, I'll show you some examples straight away um, about first two brands that failed to convey cultural meaning. The red pictures you see are ads from Dolce & Gabbana. To keep it very quick, the Italian fashion brand decided to hire Asian models and ask them to eat traditional Italian food with chopsticks. Didn't go over well. The Asian community felt absolutely offended. Uh, Dolce & Gabbana had to cancel a catwalk and major event in Asia, turns hundreds of thousands of negative social media mentioned. The negative impact on revenue is millions of dollars. In blue, we see an ad that had been created in-house by Pepsi, and in short, that was about Kendall Jenner. Basically, stopping a Black Lives Matter type of riot with a can of Pepsi. And with all due respect for Kendall Jenner, who is a talented young lady, she grew up in Calabasas, which is 10 minutes from where I live and where I'm uh, based today. And I can tell you that we've never seen a, a Black Lives Matter riot in Calabasas. So she just was incredible, if you will. And it also brings to your attention, is it really for Pepsi the place to be to try to stop a Black Lives Matter type of protest? So cultural meaning done right, and now I want to show you an example of a great brand, great ad that really shows how we can make um, cultural meaning relatable for our audience. And Nike has a strong culture of embracing social issues. And I'd say, in my opinion, that most of the time, if not all of the time, they do really well here. So brand must harness culture, that's super important. We see a direct impact on uh, consumers' de decision, about 25% of brands' cultural involvement impact the consumer decision, or should I rather say the purchase decision is impacted at 25% by, by that brand involvement in culture. We see an example from Lululemon at the bottom of my screen. What's very uh, important here is to say that brands that don't get it right really suffer from it, whereby not only consumers will no longer uh, buy from those brands, but really no likelihood eventually advocate against them or cancel them. Here on my screen, we see a bunch of fun examples. We have Bruce Willis and uh, pitching advanced auto parts through die-hard batteries. We have Budweiser uh, WhatsApp that created a remake of the ad during the COVID quarantine. Bottom right, lots of fun is Blockbuster, the last Blockbuster location that's in Bend, Oregon, survives as an Airbnb, whereby you can rent this room and spend the night there. So that's uh, culturally relevant and relatable for our audience. 10 meetings, 10 essential meanings are covered in the book. And today we're not going to look at all 10 in the interest of time. But we'll start with the first one, that's the pursuit of happiness. And there is a quote in the book from a young lady in Los Angeles who says on Instagram, I live alone in a forest of flags. And that's to say that the more connected we are, the lonelier we feel for all the devices, for all the social media, and messaging apps we have access to. Sadly, especially younger generations, millennials, most importantly, Gen Z, have very few people, if any, they can relate to in real life. So what we look for as people before even being consumers is basic yet important emotions of comfort and coziness and joy, simplicity, something intimate, empathy and joy is interesting because 
in contrast with happiness that is loosely defined concept joy is very clearly defined as intense fleeting emotions that we experience in small moments and an example in advertising in branding is from jenny walker jenny walker worked with a psychologist who specializes in happiness studies his name is matt killingworth and what they determined is a direct connection direct linkage between joy and sales as such Jenny Walker decided to evolve its tagline into joy will take you further keep walking second meaning for us today is imperfect is perfect and that has to do with authenticity and we see really a steep departure in advertising and branding from what we had five seven ten years ago where everyone looked perfect towards something that is a lot more relatable for audiences authenticity says uh, kim kardashian is a skill to get people to really like you for you instead of a character written for you by somebody else of course we may or may not like the kardashians that's a, a personal standpoint uh, in anything we can't argue that they're very authentic. Some examples of authentic brands here is IKEA, Levi's, legacy brand from the Gold Rush. Remember, we Levi started uh, creating clothing for people digging gold, basically, and did stick to this legacy over time. Pinterest is another one where users of the platforms express themselves in their own worlds and collect uh, things pin to use the Pinterest expression, things, items that matter to them, that are meaningful to them. Yelp is another one whereby you can peer review restaurants. And here again, I think it's a great illustration of people like people like themselves and people will listen to their friends, families, and people they can relate to, whereby Yelp is often more powerful, Open Table or any other review website is likely more powerful than food critics for example and the last one here is a brand of um, underwear garments and interestingly back to what i said about two minutes ago airy advertises with real people not perfect models and the outcome is as you may know victoria's secret that has been a perfect brand if you will and what i mean by this is relied on perfect models and lots of shows and lots of glitter and confettis and lights well victoria's secret is struggling today one because uh, these women are respectful but just not relatable and in contrast airy is opening stores and is growing double digits why because it is personally meaningful to their clients it is relevant and it is a brand that people can relate to Nostalgia is another very powerful meaning. That's because we live in a time that's compelling, but unsettling. And what I mean by this is, look, it's really cool to talk about AI and VR and machine learning and uh, come up with any acronym you want. It's fascinating. It's also very unsettling because we don't know what's going to happen over the next three, five, seven years. And for this reason, let alone after the pandemic, we like to come back to a time when things were simple, not as complicated and not as uncertain as they are today. And nostalgia is omnipresent in advertising and branding. We see this in real estate where you see downtown Manhattan, the west side of Chicago, in San Francisco, you see old factories that are now being converted in very trendy, very expensive lofts, right? Those were nuts and bolts factories back in the day. They are now very expensive housing. In retail, Urban Outfitters, Skills, Polaroid, all those brands rely on nostalgia to revive, basically, or to sell new products, as Skills does. And in music, it's very interesting to see that vinyl is doing so well in terms of growth. What's even more interesting is while music downloads from the Apple stores are down, people uh, don't buy as much music. Again, double digits growth 
in physical formats and we see this across all artists and across all age groups. And what I mean by this is, yeah, of course, the Rolling Stones and the Pink Floyd will sell vinyls to people 55 plus. And you see the likes of Justin Bieber, Justin Timberlake, Taylor Swift, BTS doing extremely well in physical formats in the younger 18 to 35 age groups. So a few examples here of nostalgia as implemented in product development, in branding, brand identity, in advertising, his Polaroid. Again, very interesting. Nobody needs a Polaroid these days because we can take thousands, if not dozens of thousands of pictures with our cell phones. It's obviously more practical, easier to store, easier to share. We can think of 70 reasons why we like our phone better than Polaroid, but Polaroid is going through a revival. That is because there is this experience, this reveal of the picture coming out of a camera and this experience of sharing this picture in near real time as it reveals itself with your friends around you. And that's something that no camera phone can do. I don't care how amazing the quality of the camera and the picture and the filters and all that. Neon is an interesting technology because it is a very basic, very old technology. And what I mean by this is today we have plenty of great LED displays and flat screens and lasers and all that is great. And Leon is a technology from the 1920s. It's super simple, gas, glass, electricity. That said, it's a form of art. And in my interview with a board member of the Museum of Neon Science here in Los Angeles, he brought to my attention that nothing glows, nothing shines, nothing produces lights as brightly, as vividly as neon. And for this reason, as human beings, we're attracted to the light, we're attracted to neons. And for this reason, neon, which once again is very old technology, is very popular with our younger audiences like Gen Z or millennials. It's also if I may use this expression, very Instagrammable. A couple of examples of brands that leverage uh, Neon. Interestingly, you have a very high-end legacy brand, and that's Tiffany here. You also have Kiehl's that sells cosmetic personal care products. And here you have Milk. Uh, this one is in um, West Hollywood, Los Angeles. That's just to say Milk is a, a quick service restaurant type of place. So the point here is to say that we can use Neon in high-end legacy brand luxury retail, in casual restaurants, in cosmetics, and there are many, many more other examples. Few examples, that's from my personal connection by, uh, collection, I'm sorry, by the way, I really love Neon Signs. That is a health club in London that's called Gymbox. So it's a pretty cool 3D Neon, if you will. This is in a restaurant in San Francisco. Again, in interestingly, this restaurant is blocks away from LinkedIn. And it's interesting because it caters to an audience of uh, um, very connected, tech savvy individuals. Very often, you know, they're 35 years old and younger. Yet, this bar chose, this restaurant chose to use a neon, not just a, a fancy display. It says cocktails, oysters, and mischief. And the last one is a picture I took in Los Angeles because Hollywood is Hollywood. And it says, please don't do coke in the bathroom. Next meaning we want to look at is experience and influence as the new status symbol. And what we see in the background is the Museum of Ice Cream, which ironically is arguably not a museum, more so an experiential experience, an experiential museum, an experiential place, if you will, that people go to to get their pictures taken. That's basically the point of it. So in academia, there is a concept that we've called for years conspicuous consumption. And what this means is advertising our wealth with expensive things. And that is how you buy a Rolls Royce or you carry a Louis Vuitton bag. Now, in the world we live in, the emphasis is really on experiences, what people want to do. And interestingly, 
in traditional marketing we will say that um, you tell seven to ten friends about great brands now with social media you advertise your experiences meaning a weekend at a fancy hotel meaning a trip to las vegas and so on and so forth to hundreds possibly thousands possibly possibly dozens of thousands of people on social media platform so the point is to say that social media has one shifted our interest towards experiences rather than necessarily owning material goods and to amplify this traditional concept this very core academic concept of conspicuous consumption everyone is necessarily the hero of their own imagination that's from franz kafka and what you see here is Paul Smith, which is a clothing brand, and that is their store on Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles. People refer to this as the pink wall. But you see at the bottom left of my screen is again millennials and Gen Z, certainly not to stigmatize, but a lot of millennials and Gen Z getting their pictures taken in front of that pink wall because they identify with the color because it is so Instagrammable. And that's really cheap advertising for Paul Smith. The reality is I spoke to their security person. They just have to paint the wall fresh every three months. But a bucket of paint or two <laughs> every three months for dozens of thousands of social media mentions a day, here again, is pretty impactful, pretty cheap advertising, if you ask me. In brand activation, a couple of compelling examples on my screen top left is Eminence, Bud Light, and we have Epson on the right. And again, here the point is to say those experiences are immersive, involving, culturally relevant, and Instagrammable. The last meaning we want to look at is a chapter that I, I really want to stress I wrote with respect for everyone's faiths and beliefs. But the chapter is called The Sacred, The Secular, and The New Preachers. And the point of this chapter is to say that while church attendance is down double digits in the US, that's not because people do not believe in anything anymore. That is because as consumers, we tend to transfer this belief in a higher power from the sacred to brands. And what you see on my screen is a screenshot of SoulCycle. And when SoulCycle had filed for IPO back in 2015, it is clearly mentioned on the first page of that IPO filing that, I, uh, that SoulCycle is a workout, but most importantly, it's really a cultish brand whereby we want a charismatic leader that is going to guide the crowd and the fitness ability proficiency really comes second. So that's one example to say that we still believe in something or in someone. Again, brands are increasingly taking over that role. This is a quote from Scott Galloway. Many of you are likely familiar with Scott Galloway. He's an industry analyst, he's a media personality. He is an author, he is a clinical professor at NYU. He is also an entrepreneur. And uh, Galloway says, Google is not a search engine. Google is an atheist God. Where do we pray? Where do we send information? Hope there is divine intervention and get a better answer back. Our new God, Google. And the point is to say that many of us, most of us, possibly all of us, confide to, to Google and expect that immediate answers back. And in that fashion, this search bar we use is taking over our belief, unlike going to church, for example, we simply don't have to wait for the answer when we ask Google. The last example is uh, the Apple stores that I really see, in my opinion, as a metaphor for cathedrals. And I visited many, many of those stores and I looked at literally dozens and dozens of Apple stores online. And what I see is a pattern of number one, we have those very, very large doors. We enter something bigger than ourselves. Those doors have no functional purpose. Instead, 
they're really a nightmare in terms of AC and heating system. The point, however, again, is to give you this impression of something grandiose, just like when you enter a cathedral. We also see the sign above the door that is bright, that shines, and there is only one thing, just like you'd have a cross. Now, this staircase you see, which again we find in most Apple stores, it's pretty interesting because it is a glass staircase, which by definition is very inconvenient. You have to clean it all the time. It can be slippery in the winter. You have to be careful. Uh, let's not even mention the kids that are going to put their hands on the side glass panels. So it's not practical. The point here is that staircase leads you to something brighter, something you want to explore. Now, what's upstairs very often is the genius bar. The genius bar geniuses that teach you how to use Apple products. So the genius bars and geniuses, they really run the Sunday school. That's the metaphor. And who is God? God is Steve Jobs. So that's really it for our presentation today. I think the parting advice I want to um, leave you all with is whether we're individuals, we're consumers, we are marketing research, marketing practitioners, branding advertising, this whole thing is not about achieving a end goal. That's not what finding meaning is about. It's um, a quest itself, meaning we never complete that project of finding meaning. We just build upon it. Thank you for your time today. And I hope that presentation was compelling to you. And with that said, I am going to take I'm going to take a question we have here from uh, from the audience about social media influencers. And we spoke about um, influence as the new status symbol. And of course, the question has to do with what is the role of social media influencers in that process? So the answer is, in traditional advertising, we relied on celebrities, the likes of George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez, and you name it. Uh, it's good because those personalities, we can recognize them and look up to them, if you will. However, they're not necessarily relatable. And what I mean by this is as consumers, a vast majority of us don't live like George Clooney. The reason why social media influencers made their mark a few years ago is because they, uh, in academia, we call this reducing the social distance, whereby they're more, uh, they're much more relatable to you and I than George Clooney or Jennifer, Jennifer Lopez ever would be. And as such, the placement of products is a lot more authentic. With that said, over time, for most of them, that authenticity faded because they are now full productions, if you will, with teams of people producing their videos and managers and agents and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, where we're going with this is the micro-influencers with a specialized audience and a strong connection with the audience make complete sense and are very relevant to brands and products. Just want to be careful of the big influencers, the ones with followings at 10 million, 20 million, you name it. Because if it's in personal care, beauty care, it makes sense in many other product categories. They are just not, they just don't bring the credibility you want for your product. And they're not as relatable or they're no longer uh, relatable to their audience, if you will. And I think we may have a second question coming up. And, and I don't see any specific question on my screen. Um, I had one, but it, uh, I think it disappeared for some reason. With that said, I'll give you a, a second or two if you want to. Um, Emmanuel, do you want me yeah. to read it out for you? Oh, yes, please. Okay, I think you're going to like this question. 
How can we find brand hacks in a book form? I've looked for it on Amazon B and N, but it is only available electronically. Yeah, thank you. And the reason being, and we have uh, one good problem is we sold too many books. Um, it, it sounds like a humble brag, but I, I don't mean it that way. We're waiting for more books and they've just been delivered last week at the warehouse. Uh, so the book is going to be available again in a paper form uh, within the next few days, you know, likelihood uh, maybe early next year. But uh, rest assured that we received a lot of books in physical format. Also, as you suggested, you may buy the electronic version on Amazon and you can also find some sample chapters on LinkedIn and find more information about the book at ipsos.com, which I all encourage you to visit ipsos.com, which is such a great resource for thought leadership and guidance and strategy. Many papers are available completely free of charge to you on ipsos.com. That's great. Um, there was one other question that came in, but it was just uh, a show of appreciation from another listener about how great the book was. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your kind work. Well, maybe on that note, Helen, we can tell our audience, the book is written, I, I believe it's an easy read, I sincerely mean it, whereby you can learn about consumer psychology. Importantly, you can learn also about hundreds of brand hacks that you can activate as an outcome of reading the book, and you have a recap at the end of each chapter. And the point of this book is to say, I really want to be humble about us as marketers and about the, the work I do as a, a guide here, if you will. And I trust that the book is approachable and relevant to you, whether you're starting your career or you're a C-level executive. At least that's the feedback we received so far. And uh, that's really my intent in terms of how we like to connect with the audience to make things relevant and easy for you to digest, which I hope uh, came through during our webinar today. Well, I think with that said, um, and I think uh, it's true, Emmanuel, for my part, sitting here listening in on today's really interesting discussion. Um, I didn't switch screens not even once because um, I found every example really intriguing. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And in the meantime, we always welcome an opportunity to speak with you. So please feel free to reach out to us, to Emmanuel directly. That now concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks, Emmanuel. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll speak soon.